Okay, uh, welcome. Good day, good evening, good morning to everyone. Um, we're starting out with a, a lecture I'm very much looking forward to because here's a thought. Uh, I'm actually simultaneously teaching apologetics here in, in Manila, BJMBC. And uh, I've been processing this a lot, thinking about my topics for the class I'm teaching here. Uh, and here's one of the thoughts. You know, we can do, we can do an apologetics course and maybe worst case scenario, make the entire apologetics course focused on atheistic secular materialism. Sometimes apologetics looks like that. Okay, that's not, that's, that's not right. So we broadened it out a good bit and we talked about uh, other religions, worldviews, we went broader. Okay, I think that's a significant advance. Um, here's one other layer <laughs> I, I think that we have to go to. If apologetics is truly, as we've said it is, uh, learning how to communicate the faith well to people who do not share it, or as John Frame says it, apologetics is theology applied to unbelief. The average person, the most, the most, um, the most frequent person that you're talking to, actually isn't deeply dedicated to Catholicism, Buddhism, Islam, or anything else. He's basically thinking about how to pay the bills and how to like buy the next, you know, the new iPad Pro that just came out or something. I mean, that's pretty much where he's at, right? And so these next two lectures, um, postmodernism, religious pluralism, and just generally irreligion, just a person who comes away and says, yeah, that's nice for you. This is probably the most likely group of people we're actually speaking to. So these two, these next two lectures are really are really critical for us um, in our practical application of apologetics, and that's why I've been looking forward to them. Uh, Dr. Newton graduated with a PhD. BJU served as the dean of students at BJU. How many years were you in that position? Eight years. Eight years. Um, so that's that's a lot of time to get to know people, a lot of time to get to know. The <laughs> The, the, the challenges and struggles that come up in a population of students and uh, just to work through things, right? Um, and I, I do think that very much qualifies him among many other qualifications for our time here. Um, and then at this point, as I understand it, you are working, really focusing on integrating biblical worldview into the, across the curriculum. Is that, am I understanding it right? Or maybe I'll just let you see. Let's talk about it. Yeah, yeah, that's, uh, that's correct. Um, I've got, several projects that uh, they want me to work on. So I'm technically full-time faculty at the seminary teaching some undergraduate Bible courses as well. Great. All right, so we have a very, very qualified speaker and I know he's gonna, he's gonna share some good content with us. Looking forward to it very much. Uh, Brother Yuzam Tanlian, if you're still there and if you're able, uh, love to have you open us in prayer. And um, then from that time, Dr. Newton, the time is yours. Okay. Just hear me? I hear you now. Oh, okay, good. Yes, Father, we come again in this way. It is so much enjoyable to have this kind of technology advancement. And, uh, we really appreciate the way you have and, uh, and uh, given us this kind of provision. And uh, we pray that, Father, and uh, as we are going to explore into the things that and the apologetics which is so important for especially today and uh, as we are going to look into the postmodernism and also the pluralism which will be really help us to be strengthened and also not only us but also to others and that uh, we might be able to help the others so father and uh, we are so thankful and that uh, we pray that father and this time will be a great beneficial time for each one of us Thank you for Dr. Needham and all the students in there. We just commit our time into your hands for your glory. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Amen. <clears throat> yes, thank you. So uh, I greet you all in the name of our Lord. It's such a privilege to, um, to participate in this uh, series this morning. Um, I don't purport to be an expert on postmodernism in the least. But I have had the privilege of uh, working in a college setting for 16 or 17 years now. And uh, though obviously our, 
our college, our university here is a Christian college, and we repudiate, we, we refute um, postmodernism. Um, one of the things we'll talk about is that you don't have to uh, really believe all of the tenets of postmodernism to be affected by it. And I'll use this analogy. Um, I don't know if, if where you live, if uh, smoking, like smoking a cigarette is, is something that a lot of people do. It's becoming a little less common here in the United States of America, thankfully. But you, you don't have to actually smoke a, a cigarette, a cigar yourself to be affected by that smoke. There's something called secondhand smoke. And uh, that's where I think postmodernism has even affected some of our evangelical churches and institutions. Maybe they aren't uh, smoking the cigarette, so to speak, themselves, uh, but they're being affected by that secondhand smoke. So I, I think this is an important topic, um, and we will we'll try to work through what postmodernism is, how it has demonstrated itself in various areas of life, and uh, certainly we wanna leave uh, a lot of time at the end to talk about a couple of key scriptural passages that I think will help us in answering objections that come from a postmodern mindset. I won't take a lot of time to introduce myself. That's not the main point of our gathering together online uh, this morning, this evening, but um, just so you know where I'm coming from, um, uh, I obviously am American. I grew up in the mid Midwest part of the United States of America, and I've studied history and theology here at Bob Jones University. Went through the seminary maybe just a couple of years before Dr. Arnold. We were able to uh, be uh, church members together here in Greenville and really appreciate what he's doing there in Southeast Asia um, and through endeavors like this. I, I'm married, been married for 17 years, have four children. They're ages 12 to 5. And so uh, life is, is really full and very enjoyable. And um, I'm just so grateful for all of God's kindness to me. I, I do echo the thoughts of scripture that I, I am of all people most blessed. Uh, so that's a little bit of where I'm coming from. I've had the opportunity the last eight years to teach a course on apologetics and worldview to undergraduate students. And um, one of the, the topics that we cover is postmodernism, and I've, I've tried to expand on that a good bit for our talk here this morning. Uh, please, as I, I, I'm new to this, you're, you're not, so as is your custom, you know, please feel free to ask questions, and we'll try to stop every 20 minutes, 15 or 20 minutes, um, to, to consider those as, as much as we have time. Um, Postmodernism is notoriously difficult to define. You know, what is it? And we'll, we'll try to get at that from several different angles, but I'll just say this, um, there isn't any one postmodernism. Like if you're postmodern, this is what you believe and this is how you live. Really at the very core of postmodernism is the idea that everything in life, what we read, what we say, how we live, what we believe, all of that is open to interpretation. It, it, it's really, there's nothing that's very certain at all. It's just all kind of up in the air, as we would say, and you're not quite sure what to make of it, and you sort of try to figure it out on your own. In fact, you may be wondering about this title slide in this building, you know, is, is this where I live? Oh, well, no. Um, in fact, I'm not even in my own office. If you're wondering, if you're looking at the books behind me, um, I like books, but this is actually our Dean's office. Uh, it was a good place to hole up uh, this morning here at the seminary. And so I want, I want to give him credit for the books behind me. But, but this picture um, is just an example of postmodern architecture in the sense that, you know, it's interesting. Um, it, it shows some uh, skill, I guess, to design this and, and put it together. But what does it mean and what are they really going after? Well, no one can really be sure. And that's kind of the point of postmodernism. Uh, I don't know if you have a Bible handy, but I would direct your attention here at the outset uh, to just a couple of verses actually in Ecclesiastes. And um, Ecclesiastes 7 the, the writer whom we, whom we believe uh, is Solomon uh, says this. This is verse 27 of Ecclesiastes 7. Behold, I have discovered this, says the preacher, 
adding one thing to another to find an explanation, which I am still seeking out, but have not found. I have found one man among a thousand, and I have, but I have not found a woman among all of these. That's, a, that's an interesting verse that we won't go into, the interpretation of. Behold, I have found only this, that God made men upright, but they have sought out many devices. And that, that word devices there, um, I'm reading from a New American Standard Bible, but that word devices has the idea of schemes. And what's interesting about it is that Solomon, up through this point in the book, has been trying to figure out the scheme. We would call it, I think, a worldview. He's, he's trying to figure out why the world is the way it is and where ultimate satisfaction and meaning um, reside. And, and he says, you know, we've, we've added one thing to another. Uh, you would call this an apologetics uh, evidentialism. You, you, you've, you've amassed all of the evidence. You're trying to figure out, you know, you're surveying everything and all of the data and you're crunching it and you're um, putting it together and you're trying to figure out what it all means. And he says, I, I still haven't found it out. I, I, I've tried, he says in chapter two, I've tried wealth. I've tried women. I've tried um, lots of different kinds of pleasures. I've tried wisdom, you know, human wisdom merely. And none of that has enabled me to figure out the scheme, the worldview. God made men upright. God made us as human beings with a sense of eternity. Okay, he, he put something inside of us, Ecclesiastes 3.11 says, so that we would understand that this world isn't all there is. There's, there's more than that just meets our eyes. There's something beyond. There's something eternal. And, and we were given the ability in Adam to be upright, to be, to be morally right, to do the right thing. Mor morality is at the heart of wisdom. And what did we do with that? Well, well we... we turn it on its head. We twist it. We distort it. We try to figure out our own way. And when that comes to worldviews, as I'm sure you've talked about some, basically what any false worldview, anything other than scripture does, is they take God and either change that God, so he's unrecognizable and not the true God at all, or they, they absolutely remove him from the center of everything, and everything then just collapses. It, it, you can't make sense of life without God, and that is actually um, the Holy Spirit's point in Ecclesiastes. Ultimately, you fear God and keep his commandments. This, this is the conclusion. This is the key to, to understanding ourselves and our world, and certainly our responsibility to God. So we're going to talk about one of those schemes today. It's a recent one. You would think that it follows modernism, and in some ways it does. People sometimes argue that postmodernism is, is actually an extension of modernism. It, it's not actually a contradiction of it. It's just pushing modernism to its limits and, ta and, and taking it as seriously as possible. And it ends up being very, very dark. Uh, people who are consistent with postmodern ideas um, are going to be depressed. They're going to be, um, they're going to be disillusioned. They're going to be searching, but not truly finding. Now, for us to understand uh, postmodernism, we've got to back up a little bit. And so I want to take a couple of minutes here and actually talk about the Enlightenment. I'm sure many of you are familiar with this period in history. But maybe about 300 years ago in Western civilization, Europe and then in, in, in America, even before we became an official country, there, there was this movement of thought of intellectualism called the Enlightenment. And basically what it did is it, it broke up the authority that the church, specifically the Roman Catholic Church and then some of the state churches in Europe, like Reformed churches and Lutheran churches and the Anglican church in England, and it, and it broke up their authority because for over a thousand years in, in Western civilization, the church was the dominant authority when it came to telling us, telling them what they should believe. 
And so people were generally believers in God. Many of them were not true believers, but they believed in a God, the God that the church told them to believe in. And, and then some thinkers came along and they challenged the idea that what should determine our beliefs and our thinking is ultimately scripture, is ultimately the, ch the church in, in, in a Catholic way of, of thinking. They, they said that that's not how we truly know things. We need to throw off that authority and we need to think for ourselves. And so they replaced revelation, they replaced scripture, or they replaced church authority with the authority of their own thinking, of reason, or, or of their own observation, uh, uh, empiricism, what, what they could experience, what they could observe. And that, that started um, a domino effect. I don't know if you've ever played dominoes, but you have one tile and you push it over and then and the tiles that come after it, they start falling down too. Well, that's what happened uh, specifically in, phil in philosophy in the West with the Enlightenment. And so you had, um, uh, you had this, this digression You've heard of progression, things that are supposedly getting better, progressing. Well, this is the opposite. And so, first of all, people said, okay, well, I, I think there's still a God. I, I still want to be religious, but I don't think he's actually um, involved in my world. I, I, don't, I don't think he, he actually came to earth. I don't think he speaks to us today through scripture or any other means. I, I think he created the world, and then he kind of set it down to work its, itself out, and then he walked away. And this is what's called deism. And so the first major move away from a theistic worldview was deism. Well, after a while, and it didn't take that long, people started to question whether, whether they really needed a God at all, because science was seemingly uh, progressing in its explanation of life. And so people said, you know, I, I, don't, I don't think actually there's a God at all. I think we can figure out life without any kind of God. And, and so they, they created what, what people have come to know, the worldview um, named naturalism. And basically the way I try to help students understand naturalism is this, just picture a box, just a regular box that you would get a package in. And, and that box is completely sealed up. There, there, are no, um, there are no holes in it, there are no openings, there are no cracks, it's completely sealed up. Okay. That is a naturalist worldview. He's got to come up with explanations for everything in life. He's got to come up for explanations inside that box. Um, and so, you know, the, the, how we got here, how we as human beings with our intellectual capabilities and creative abilities and relational abilities, you've got to come up with an explanation for all of that inside your natural box. There, there's no supernatural, they say. Everything just evolved. And, and so you've got these, you, you've got not only the material, you've got, you've got things like love and, and hope and, and joy and, and this sense of, of, of a transcendence of, of an eternity. And you've got to come up with explanations for all of those things inside the box. Well, after a while, people start to apply that really consistently and, and, and then they start to ask questions like, okay, I'm trying to explain all of life through evolution, through the idea that there is no, um, there is no God, there is no basis for morality in the Bible. Um, we just, we're, we're kind of making it up as we go. And they start to really think about the implications of that. And, and, and it, it really jars them. It, it, it confronts them with the reality that, that there is some hopelessness, uh, that this, this is not giving us all the answers. And so what do they do? Well, they look for something else. They either say there are no answers, what we call nihilism, which is very dark. There are no answers, no meaning, no purpose. Or they may turn to themselves and say, I'm just going to create my own meaning and purpose and value. That's called existentialism. Or they may say, we're going to, as a group, our little community, you know, we, we have a class um, this morning or this evening, whatever your time zone is, um, and, and we're going to have a certain explanation for life in our class. It doesn't necessarily mean anything for the rest of the world, um, it, but, but it's going to make sense of life for us, and we're going to try to be content with that. And, 
And, and so we have this postmodern uh, mindset that emphasizes meaning in, in a group, in a, in a community, um, if not in an in individual thinker. Um, the, uh, the questions here, I'm, I'm seeing these come up. I'll just pause here for a second um, in, the, in the chat. Uh, deism to naturalism, so I don't want to overstate things. The, these things are kind of, some people are going a naturalistic bent, some people are going a deistic bent. Um, Darwinism, I would agree with what John is saying, that Darwinism is not the beginning, more the culmination of the shift. Darwin's origin of species is 1859, and so he, along with Marx, when it came to an economic explanation of life, an economic worldview, and Freud um, and his psychological explanation of the world, these were manifestations of naturalism that, that really became dominant into the 20th and now the 21st century. Now, let, let's talk about postmodernism then and, 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 and why, why postmodernism? Well, um, let me put up in front of you, I, I think I may be a, um, a little bit behind on my slide here. I'm going to skip over this. This is a really interesting Harvard address by um, the Russian Solzhenitsyn, but I'm going to skip over it um, and uh, and talk about this. So you just got to use your imagination a little bit. This is a house, okay? My graphic design abilities are very limited. So, so this is a two-story house, and in the bottom story, you've got you've got knowledge that we can count on like facts and science and math two plus two is four it's four whether you're vietnamese or whether you're portuguese or whether you're from singapore or america it doesn't matter two plus two is four okay so so we can be sure naturalism says we can be sure of what's in the bottom story and if you want to really do life the right way you better stay in the first level uh, but then people start to wonder about, okay, yeah, but isn't there more than that? And, and they say, okay, well, if you want to kind of have a, a faith in a God, if you want to have hope in something beyond the facts of life, you know, it, if you want to be religious, that's fine. But you need to understand that it's just kind of a blind leap of faith. And don't, don't try to connect the two levels. There's no staircase. There's, there, there, there's no connection between the two. Either you deal with what is was real and what we can count on in the bottom level, or you can go up and spend your time on the second floor, but you just got to understand that that doesn't have any necessary connection to real life. All right. Well, if people, Francis Schaeffer, a famous apologist in Europe in the 20th century, second half of the 20th century, um, is the one who really uh, helped people understand this, this picture. And he said, okay, if people really start to believe in that, they are going to come to a point of despair. And that really is one of the key manifestations of postmodernism. Um, I'm not going to read this whole quote, but if you'll focus just on the last part of it, um, where this Enlightenment thinker from France, Condorcet, says, we can entertain a hope that is almost a certainty of the absolute perfection of the human race. He's saying in the 1700s, we're getting to the point, we're going to get to the point very soon, where through science and technology and information and education, we're going to be able to perfect the human race. Uh, we're going to get rid of slavery. We're going to get a get rid of inequality. We're going to get rid of all of the problems that we have. He, of course, didn't believe in a sin nature, as the Bible clearly teaches. And so this Enlightenment project went on for a couple hundred years, maybe 150 years, and then we came to the 20th century, and what happened? Well, um, I don't know if any of you have been to Washington, D.C., but this is a museum in the capital of, of, of my country, um, and it's a tribute to uh, the Holocaust victims and survivors from World War II in Germany. And um, you, you, you look at this and you look at all of these, um, these, these shoes and you are reminded of the millions of people, not only in Europe, um, but across the world, in Asia, of course, as well, um, millions of people, uh, they estimate maybe 50 million people who died in World War II, either through the fighting or, of course, because of communist dictators like, uh, like Stalin or the Nazi um, uh, murderer uh, Adolf Hitler. And, and so 
people in Europe started asking questions like, all right, we thought that we were getting to the point of perfection and, and, and we're developing all this amazing technology like you can actually fly this very heavy object through the air and, and, and you can create something that, that detonates, that, 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 that blows up. And, and, and this is amazing technology um, for the 1940s. It certainly was, though we've advanced beyond that now. But, but look at what we're doing. We're murdering each other. The, the world is, is, is at war with, with one another. And so people started to question, I mean, is, is this all there is? Is this where progress, science, technology, the naturalistic box is, um, is, is going to... Um, it, this is this is what it's come to. This is what it's explaining, and so people started to question whether the box was all there is. Now we would say, well, of course the box isn't all there is. The Bible clearly teaches that the box is only part of reality, and 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 you can't even explain. You can't even understand the box. You can't even understand um, what we see, what we hear, what we smell, our world, so to speak without God. That's what we started with in Ecclesiastes. But that's not where postmodern thinkers, of course, turned. They, they didn't want to turn back to God. They, they wanted to turn to another explanation. And so um, that, that leads us into, uh, into postmodernism. I'm going to stop here. Any questions, Dr. Arnold, feel free to, to um, jump in. Any questions so far that we should stop and consider before I keep going? Yeah. Okay. All right, um, one more slide here, uh, and this is just um, a, a quote that I'll read um, to kind of enforce what I'm, I'm saying here about the, the hopelessness that um, the world, particularly the Western world, was coming to in the middle of the 20th century. Um, I don't know if you recognize this face, but, but this man, J. Robert Oppenheimer, was actually the architect. He was the director of what's called the Manhattan Project which uh, developed the atomic bomb. And at the end of World War II, particularly after those two bombs were dropped on Japan, he um, started to feel very guilty. And he even walked into the President of the United States office, President Truman, and he, of course, President Truman wanted to, wanted to meet this celebrated physicist, this, this scientist um, with, with so much um, you know, intellectual gifting, and that had led this, this project. And, and he walked into the president's office and he said, Mr. President, I feel I have blood on my hands. He understood that he had helped develop an, an amazing technology that had d d destroyed a lot, thousands upon thousands upon hundreds of thousands of lives. Um, and so what, what do we do? What, what does humanity do when the explanation that the Enlightenment gave, that some, some Enlightenment thinkers at least gave, the ones that didn't believe in God, um, what do we do when those really are not culminating in progress, in perfection, but in destruction? They seem to be going the other way. Well, that's where postmodernism comes in. And I'll talk for just a, a few minutes about some of the manifestations of it before we talk about kind of uh, what it is at its essence. So postmodernism technically started in the realm of architecture, and I'm not going to spend any time on that. I'm not an architectural um, person in the least, but, um, but I, I showed you that picture on the title slide. And so sort of this, this feeling of we're going to create something interesting, but what does it mean? Uh, no, no one knows. Um, uh, and this sense of uncertainty that you do see in art. Um, I'll just put up a couple of these again are from um, a, a famous uh, art museum in, in Washington, D.C., I believe. And you look at that and, you know, I couldn't necessarily do that. Okay, I'm, I'm not that good with my hands. I'm sure that took some skill, but, but what does that mean? Well, that's not really the point. Or, or you take this. Okay, now again, um, there, there is some design to this. There is some intentionality, um, at least to the fabrication of these colored panels. Uh, but what does it mean? Well, you could walk through the postmodern exhibits in Washington, D.C., or New York, or London, or wherever you go, um, and you would find this very same thing. What they scream is uncertainty. Um, 
And, and the idea, as Martin Heidegger, a famous 20th century philosopher, put it, the idea that art doesn't represent truth. So maybe you're familiar with the Sistine Chapel, Michelangelo, what he painted in, in Rome. And, and uh, though we would disagree with, with the theology of the, of the building where that's housed, it, it, it really is, is amazing art, and it represents theological truth. But in postmodern art, the point is not to represent truth. The, the, the point is to create truth. Now, then you ask, well, well what kind of truth is this creating? And, and, and we don't know. I'm not sure that the... Um, again, the skillful painter, again, I couldn't do this, but what did he mean? I'm, I'm not really sure. And, and I would say this, just to kind of pause for a second and, and make a point of application. As, as Dr. Arnold mentioned, I've, I've had the opportunity over the last 12 years to work directly with college students, and particularly in the area of discipleship. And I would say one of the sobering realities of working with college students, many of whom are from America, but not all, we've got 40 countries or so represented in our student body, is that um, uh, in, in more recent years, as the years passed, um, I, I could see changes in, in their general mood and their general outlook. And it was toward more discouragement, more despair, more uncertainty. And I think there are a lot of factors to that. It would be o overly simplistic to try to explain that um, in, in one way, other than, of course, their, their focus is, is not on Jesus Christ. But, but there are a lot of hard things in their lives. I'm not um, um, diminishing the significance of that. But I think really it's, it's in part that they live in a country, um, they live in a world that's becoming less certain, that's becoming, everything is up for grabs. And you see that in some of these, um, some of this disillusionment. There are theories in science that contributed to postmodernism, like um, uh, Hubble's Law, uh, which says that the farther away a galaxy is, the faster it's moving. In other words, I, I would think, okay, you've got two objects and they have, um, they, they have the same amount of time to move um, and uh, they start at the same point, then they should be you know, moving at the same rate. Well, well, Hubble says actually what we're observing is that the galaxies that are farthest away are moving even faster than the ones that are closer. Well, what does all that mean? Well, it just dis disoriented people. Does that mean that there was some kind of beginning? Well, of course it does, but, but what does all this scientific theory mean for our world and in our everyday life, as Dr. Arnold mentioned at the beginning? Now, the area, those are kind of interesting, but I'm not going to spend any more time on science and art and that sort of thing. Where I really want to spend a few minutes is in the area of language, okay? And, um, and so we need, to, we need to talk a little bit about some really intellectual kind of um, heady topics that I can't fully get my mind around, and I don't spend a lot of time on them because it's a little disorienting, frankly. But we need to talk about a few concepts in the area of language and literary criticism. So there was a, the father of what they call modern linguistics, a guy named Saussure. He said that words are signs that, that refer to concepts. All right. And so postmodern thinkers, he died in 1913, so a little over 100 years ago. Postmodern thinkers pick up that idea and they say, okay, words are signs. Now, just think of if you're driving on um, a road and, uh, in, in a big city and there's a sign that directs you to either go this way to the airport or this way to keep on going around the city. Okay, And, and we, we follow those signs. If we're wise, we follow those signs and try to understand them. But, but the, the importance of those signs is what? That they actually point to something real. If, if I was, okay, um, about three years ago, I was able to be with Brother Ping in Singapore. And I remember he picked up my friend and me from the airport and um, we were driving. Now, now if, if we uh, followed those signs, uh, let's say we were going back to the airport after our visit there and that sign that said airport this way didn't actually point to the airport. It just pointed to another sign. And when you got to that sign, that sign pointed to a different sign. And so, so yeah, there are words, but they're not actually pointing to the airport. They're not actually pointing to something real. They're just pointing to each other. And eventually you get lost in all of that. Well, that's how some postmodern thinkers, particularly in the area of language, uh, that's what they came to believe about, um, about language. Um, that, that, that words don't actually refer 
excuse me, <clears throat> words don't actually refer to, to reality. They, they just refer to each other. They're just signs that point to each other. It, it's like, um, let, me, let me give you a, an illustration here. It's like a hall or a room of mirrors. And you easily get lost in a room like this. Why? Well, because everything starts to point you to everything else and you try to find your way, but there's no way out um, uh, of, this, of this language room of, of mirrors. These things just point to one another. And you can see how disorienting that could be. You, you can see how that messes with people's minds. If, if, if you say, okay, God created the world and, and, and sinners rebelled, starting with Adam, and, and then God sent his son to live a perfect life and die on the cross and be raised from the dead and be exalted in heaven. And now he offers salvation to any and all who will repent of their sins and believe in Jesus Christ. Okay, you've just used a whole bundle of terms that have meaning because there's a real God, there's a real world, creation really did happen, people really do sin. Uh, there, there is a God-man named Jesus Christ who, who came and he lived for 33 or so years and he died and was raised and he really does sit at the right hand of the Father in heaven and he does offer a real salvation. And all of that's tangible and material, of course, but it's all real. But a postmodernist says, well, I realize that the, the term God um, points to creation and the term creation points to people and, and people point to bad things and bad, bad actions point to the need for some kind of solution. But, but, but there's no meaning beyond all of that. It's just, you're trying to make sense of what you observe, but, but there's no reality that those words point to. There was another thinker that's, that's very famous in postmodernism named uh, Derrida, Jacques Derrida. And, and Derrida introduced this idea of, it's a technical term, but, but we need to try to understand it uh, on a basic level, deconstructionism. All right. So you take two words, destruct. Okay. If you've had little kids or you have little kids, you know that it can be a little bit destructive sometimes uh, in how they play um, and, and tearing things apart. And then construction, um, so the, the Bible's Memorial Bible College has been constructing a new building. Very exciting to see what the Lord's raising up there. Okay, that's, that's construction. Well, he puts those two together, deconstruction. And he says, what we need to do with a book is we need to take it and we need to break it down, destruct it, and then put it back together, construct it. And when you, when you join again those terms, you have deconstruction. Well, what does that mean? Well, that means that if you're reading a book, let's take the, the famous um, English uh, author, playwright, William Shakespeare, and he wrote a book, uh, or excuse me, a play uh, called Macbeth. All right, so people traditionally, to try to understand Macbeth, have asked, okay, what did Shakespeare mean by this character and, and what he said in this scene of the play? Um, and, and a deconstructionist comes along and says, that's not the point. You can't ever know what Shakespeare meant. He's not around to tell you. And that's not the point of, of the play or the book. The point of the book now is what kind of meaning you can derive from it. What do you understand it to mean? So, so you, you put that in the context of the Bible and you see how destructive deconstructionism is. You've got, you've got a word that, um, that, has been given to us from the Lord, the Holy Spirit breathed it out, and it's truth, but a postmodernist comes along and says, well, I know that's what you think it means. You've come along um, hundreds or thousands of years after it was, it was spoken, after it was written, and, and you've decided that this is what Ecclesiastes 7 means, or this is what John 18 means, or this is what Romans 3 means, because you're trying to make sense of the world, but you can't be sure that that's what those words mean. Um, we're going to we're going to read it according to our understanding, and that might be a communist understanding, that might be a a um, an existential understanding, that might be a postmodern understanding, that might be a liberation theology understanding. Um, the the point of deconstruction is that the author doesn't determine the meaning. I, as the reader, determine the meaning. Even today, I mean, I mean, 
you're trying to understand, and hopefully some of what I'm saying is understandable. You're trying to understand what I'm saying because because you you realize that I'm trying to communicate meaning. Well, postmodernist says it doesn't really matter what I'm trying to say. What you hear and what you think I'm saying is is what's most important. Um, there there was a famous thinker who's not technically postmodernism because he lived before postmodernism. Um, um, began somewhere in the middle of the 20th century, but his thinking was really the foundation for postmodernism, and that is um, a, a German that you probably heard of named Friedrich Nietzsche. And Nietzsche said this, he said, there are no facts, only interpretations. There are no facts, there's no truth, only interpretations. So whereas we might come to a text of scripture and, and after we work through it and do some exegesis and, and, and try to understand it, and then we get together and, and, we, and we talk online and we say, okay, what, what do you think that that verse, Ecclesiastes 7, 28, um, um, me, how, how do you understand that to, 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 to mean? Well, we can talk about that and, and debate that, but ultimately all of us are coming to scripture with the the uh, belief that what we think it means isn't ultimately the point, what, what God intended is ultimately the point. And we've got to try to understand that with the Spirit's illumination best we can. That's what we're driving at. Postmodernists like Nietzsche, uh, Nietzsche and postmodernists say, there are no facts, only interpretations. And so I'm going to read a quote here. For Derrida and for uh, Barthes, two postmodern thinkers, Readers can now forget about the old burden of trying to capture what an author was really trying to say and instead focus joyfully on the meaning they create in interpreting a text. All right, now, um, Nietzsche is going to take this a step farther, all right, um, and he's going to say that that truth is a mobile army of, of metaphors of synonyms, uh, excuse me, metonyms and anthropomorphisms. Now, I'm not going to try to um, uh, uh, unpack all of those terms. If I can just use the beginning part of that, truth is a mobile army of metaphors. All right, you see the you see the the feet of this infantry here, and that they're marching. Uh, probably some uh, exercise. Doesn't look like they're really at war, but 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 they're they're a mobile army. They're they're an infantry. All right, here's what uh, uh, Nietzsche is saying. He's saying, uh, truth isn't what we've thought it, it was. It, it's, it's not something that was given to us from God or anyone else that we can be confident in. Truth is in the hands of those in power, all right? It's, it's like a general having an infantry, and he says, he directs his infantry, okay, you need to go, um, you need to move here and try to take the right flank in, in, uh, of, of this area because we're, we are trying to get the upper hand on our enemy. He says, truth is not truth. Truth is power. Truth is, is, is a way for somebody to have control or authority over somebody else. Um, it, it, it's very dark. It's very pessimistic. And so they say people use language to oppress other people. Now, now, is it true? Um, it, 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 is it true that um, that language can be used to take control over people? Well, absolutely. It, it's what's called propaganda. And speaking of of Hitler in World War II, he was a master at propaganda. He 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 would he would create craft these speeches, and then he would deliver them over a loudspeaker, and, and he, would, um, he would rally thousands upon thousands of Germans to blindly follow his diabolical, his devilish ideas. Um, he used language in a very powerful way to control people. So it can be used that way. And you can see how somebody would, would pessimistically determine, well, that's all that language is. But, but they're absolutely wrong. Why? Well, because language is a gift from God. Just like anything else in life, it can be used the wrong way. Um, language can be twisted. It can be distorted. It can be used to hate my neighbor instead of loving my neighbor. It, it, it's like the rest of life. God gives us good gifts, and, and, and we can twist those and use those for selfish ends or for, for worse, even devilish ends. 
Um, but, but that's not why God gave them to us. And, and so ever since the Tower of Babel, yes, um, there have been people who have uh, had confusing language, who have um, um, hurt other people through their language, through what they say. But, but that's, it's a wrong conclusion to say that because people use it the wrong way, that language in and of itself is, is just a, a, a power tool. Um, it's, it's just manipulation. All right, so, so what do we do then with philosophy? So we've, we've touched on art, we've touched on science, we've, we've talked about language um, and the effects of postmodernism. That's really where postmodernism started to, I, I said effects, it's, it's kind of the source of postmodernism in a lot of ways. What about philosophy? Okay, well, philosophy is trying to answer the big questions of life. And so we're, we're saying, all right, um, where did we come from? Why are we here? Where are we going? What's, what's our purpose? How are we supposed to, to respond to one another? That, that sort of thing, these, these big or these ultimate questions. Well, philosophy, um, if it's not God's philosophy, doesn't get those answers right, but it does ask the right questions. Okay, so what is postmodern philosophy then? Well, if you take the ideas of people like Nietzsche and, and like Barthes and like Derrida and like Mikhail Foucault, and, and, and you take their ideas and you apply them to these big questions, then what are you going to come up with? You're trying to answer big questions, and they're saying that, that words don't have any ultimate meaning, that they, they don't. They don't act, they just point to one another. They just try to make sense of, of one another. Well, what does that mean for philosophy? Well, it means that we, we stop, I, I, don't, I don't mean we, but they stop caring about truth and they, and they settle for what works. It's called pragmatism. Now, any of us can be pragmatic in everyday life. We can be presented with the opportunity to take a shortcut that's either illegal or unbiblical and sinful or is unwise, but we think, well, I can get things done faster or I, you know, no one's going to know that I, I, I did this. And, and we take a shortcut pragmatically because we say it doesn't really matter. The principle of it doesn't really matter. What matters is if I just get the job done, if I, if I get there faster or if I don't have um, as, as much um, red tape in government, uh, so, so many obstacles to have to, hoops to jump through. I can just bypass all of that. Well, um, any of us can be pragmatic on a personal level day to day, um, and, and, and we're tempted to that sometimes. But pragmatism philosophically is, is not just a temptation. It, it's actually a resolution that this is what this is what life is about. How are we going to answer the big questions? We're not going to try to answer them with, with truth from above or, or, or even from our own reasoning that applies to everybody. We're just going to take our particular situation and determine what's going to work for us in this particular situation, what seems best for our culture right now, um, what most people want to do, what's going to make me feel good, and that's what we determine um, is, is good. And um, that, that idea that it's not what's truthful that matters, it's what's useful, what works, is the pragmatic philosophy of postmodernism. Now, uh, we could talk about uh, postmodernism's application in religion, um, but I'm not going to do that because essentially uh, your next talk on religious pluralism is going to do that. Postmodernism and pluralism are not the same thing. But religious pluralism, one of the ideas that contributes to religious pluralism is, is postmodernism. So it would be a little redundant. Uh, we, we won't take our time today um, to talk about pluralism so much um, and postmodernism in religion because that's what your next topic is going to be. I'll, I'll just say one thing about this. There was, there's a, a church historian in America um, who was, was very liberal. He didn't actually believe that the Bible is God's word or that Jesus is God's son. Um, uh, uh, his name is Martin Marty. And, and Martin Marty um, was a, a friend of mine, uh, went to hear him speak. And there was a student at the end of his lecture who said, Dr. Marty, um, uh, how, can, how can we know what religion is, is right? Which, which religion is the right one? 
And he said, you know, you need to think about it like this. We're all in ships. We're all in different ships. So um, one person might be in a Buddhist ship. Another person might be in a, in a Muslim ship. Another person might be in a, in a, in a Taoist ship. Uh, somebody might be in a, in a, um, um, a liberal Christian ship. Somebody might be in, 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 a, in a fundamental evangelical Christian ship. But we're all in different ships. But he says we're, we're, we're sailing to the same shore. We're, we're all going to the same place. We're getting there different ways. Our ships look a little bit different. They're taking it um, at different speeds, but we're all going to end up at the same shore. We're going to all end up uh, in heaven with God. Well, again, it's not our point to talk about pluralism today, but there are all kinds of problems with that. It, it might make people feel good when you say your religion is not wrong, but to say that all of us are headed to the same shore, that, that we're all, you know, the differences really aren't that great, that, that it's just relative to where you live and, and, and when you grew up and, and kind of your surroundings. But, you know, if you believe in God, we'll all get to the same place. Totally unbiblical, totally against the truth of Scripture. But that, at least in the West, in places like the United States of America, that idea has gained traction. There are people that, that really believe that. And if you say differently, if you say, no, actually, Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but by me. Then they're going to they're gonna say, that's out of bounds. That's wrong. You're the one now that's wrong because you said that there's only one way. So postmodernism and pluralism have a lot to do with one another. You know, just one kind of practical thing here. Um, uh, this photo, I believe, is from 1996. So that's 22 years ago, and a lot of technology has developed in those 22 years. But um, uh, this is a picture of 500 screens, TV screens, and what it's representing is the uh, is the information age where. It, it went from people learning in school, people learning from what their parents told them, maybe people picking things up from what their friends knew, to people starting, the, then there was radio, then there was television, now there's the internet. Now many people across the world carry around the internet in their pocket with their phone. And so there's all of these ideas. One of the reasons for postmodernism and the, the assertion that there is, there is no one truth, that, um, that there, are, there are many ideas and it's, it's only interpretations, is because people are so much more aware of what other people believe. And, and we, can, you know, we, we can have technology like this where people like you and me that are scattered in so many different countries can, can all chime in and, and talk about the same topic. And, and, and so people say, well, with all of this information, all of this data, all of these ideas, how can any person say there's only one way? How, how could you be so proud to think that, that your way is the only way when there are millions of ideas? All you have to do is get on the internet and type in a word and search for it and you'll come up with thousands or, or maybe tens or hundreds of thousands of different explanations for, for that one idea. How can you say that your interpretation is is the way that you have the truth. Well, that, that's just a practical um, reality in our world. Technology is a wonderful thing. We wouldn't be having this class this morning without technology, but, but because of technology and because of this boom in information all across the world, it has contributed to this uncertainty um, and this mood of postmodernism that says um, no one can say that there's only one way. I don't know if you live near a place where you can go to a to a store and have all kinds of options um, for food, let's say. Um, but, you know, obviously in Greenville, South Carolina, where I live, there are big stores like Walmart, and they sell thousands upon thousands upon thousands of different items. And, you know, how could you how could you ever you know, choose that and say, this is the best cereal, or this is the best brand of noodles, or this is, um, or this is the best ice cream, or, you know, whatever you're going to buy. How could you say that this is the best? Well, people say, if that's what it's like for food, that's what it's like for religion, or for philosophy in life as well. I'm going to pause there um, and see if there are uh, questions and uh, anything that I need to clarify, we've we've kind of tread through some pretty uh, pretty weighty stuff, terms that 
we don't use every day. So I'd be glad to try to go back and explain something that wasn't clear. Here's a thought. Um, so as you're talking through different philosophical movements, you know, this is this is this is high thought, right? And so then we go from that to thinking about like the 18 year old college freshman that comes in and is in some ways depressed and confused. Yeah. Um, and the, the distance between Derrida and the high school 17 year old freshman is really big. I mean, the, the freshman has never heard of Derrida. Um, it, you know, he, okay, he's, just, he's watched movies and played video games. How did that guy get affected by ideas that trickle down from philosophy? Um, and just if you can kind of develop how, that, how this shows up in the arts, how this shows up in literature, and just to sort of trickle down, how we get from there down to the, you know, the guy that basically compares a cares about his video games, but he is affected by the thoughts of some French philosopher. <laughs> yeah, that, that is a great question. And, and there are different, um, I, I don't know that there is, is one, um, that there's only one explanation of that, that not to sound postmodern, but, but obviously I, I don't have the omniscience to um, explain maybe in any one particular situation how it got from Derrida to the 18 year old that I'm, I'm talking to. So let me speak in general terms. Um, it, it's not, you're absolutely right. Most of these, um, these young people haven't even heard of Derrida, much less, much, much less read him. And, and I'm, I'm glad for that, by the way. But what's happened is that people who um, are uh, intellectually gifted and they, they do read this sort of thing, those are the people that tend to um, tend to come into places of, of influence. So maybe it's through government, maybe it's through uh, public uh, universities, state-sponsored universities. Maybe it's um, people that um, become um, leading intellectuals that, that people on television, um, news people on television, um, uh, interview. Maybe it's people who um, have influence in, in schools. So uh, we have a public school system in, for instance, in the United States. And so a lot of the people who teach in the public school system are going to influence um, young, young people, uh, children in that way. It's not that the children themselves, of course, like you said, are, in, are reading postmodernism. But, but I, I think what's happened, and I'll go back to my analogy of secondhand smoke. There, there is this, um, uh, there is this effect when, when the leading thinkers in a culture, in a country, in a civilization are, are suggesting that we can't be certain about anything. Certainly you can't be certain about your interpretation because there are hundreds of other interpretations. Then what, what happens is people become unsettled. And so you get into conversations, you know, 16 year olds get into conversations about life and they, they don't have anything to do with Derrida, but, but somebody says, well, do you think we should do this? And somebody else says, well, you know, my parents, my parents don't want me to do that. And, and the friend says, well, yeah, well, but, but, but who says your, your parents, you know, have a corner on the truth? Who, who, who says that, that, that they know it all? I mean, I mean, are, are you really sure that, that what they've always believed is, is, is really the truth. And, and so you get this, you get this uncertainty, this skepticism and, and actually bad leadership has contributed to this too. So, so people look at leaders in a country or in a church, maybe they have a bad experience with a, with a pastor in a church and it truly is bad. They're not, it, it, the, the pastor didn't lead well. And, and so they start to start to think, okay, well, well maybe what he said, his, may, maybe what he said was the truth was only an interpretation. And so maybe his interpretation isn't right. And I'm hearing that, that, you know, any interpretation may be okay. And so, and so they start to question. I, I think that it's not so much um, the, the hard postmodernism, at least that I'm working with here in a college situation, as it is just kind of a skepticism, a pessimism, um, a feeling of how can, how can anyone be dogmatic? And, and, and because being dogmatic um, brings pressure, it brings resistance, it can bring persecution. And we don't tend to like that, particularly here in America, we, we like to be comfortable. And so we're, um, you know, we, we, um, uh, we do things not to be dogmatic in order to 
um, alleviate that pressure. I, I think I think that's part of it. Um, I think a lot of it has to do with what people watch on TV, um, where they go on the internet, um, what voices they're listening to, who you listen to obviously is is going to, it might not be postmodernists themselves, but it's going to be people who um, really believe these skeptical ideas. And that's, I think, influencing youth, you know, m music. There's all kinds of skeptical postmodernist thinking in, in, in popular music. So I think um, technology, again, is a wonderful thing, but I think it, it has been a portal for a lot of the practical um, application of postmodernism. It's helpful. Yeah, that's good. Um, there's somebody put this on here and it's, I, I'd forgotten about it, but in the last battle, C.S. Lewis, there's a little, uh, there's a scene there and there's a little dynamic where you feel like he's, he's sort of showing you a move to this kind of skepticism and uh, depression and just giving up on being able to definitively say that something is or isn't true. Um, but in his typically C.S. Lewis way, it's delightful. <laughs> so it's good. Yeah. Um, if this is a reasonable stopping point for you, what we would do is just take our five minute break. Does this work? Sounds good. Great. Okay. Good stuff. Thank you. Uh, lots of content. So uh, I've got two minutes after the hour. Let's just come back at seven minutes after the hour and pick up here. Great. Thanks. Okay. Um, you know, uh, just one more thought about the question, uh, Dr. Arnold, that you mentioned. Um, before our break, uh, one analogy that um, I've I've used uh, for the effects of postmodernism just in everyday life with everyday kind of people um, is is coffee. Now I I drink coffee. I like coffee. Um, hope that doesn't offend you. But um, I I usually just drink regular coffee with some cream in it. Um, but um, you can get you know, around here, you, you can get coffee with all kinds of different flavors. You can, you know, put in two drips of this and, and you want this kind of milk. And, and, and it's, it's really unbelievable how specialized these coffee drinks can be. Well, I think a lot of times, at least in my context, that's how worldview works out practically. It's not that very many people are postmodern and only postmodern. But it's like they've, they've um, taken in a little bit of this and a little bit of that. And so it's, it, it's not really usually helpful to try to categorize people. I mean, you can categorize thinkers, but the people that you're trying to help and win the Lord, the, I, I wouldn't try overly hard to say, okay, this person is a postmodernist. We're just trying to understand some of the world that we live in so that we can speak to the problems that, that underlie why they are maybe living the way they are um, and, and, and at least are partially an explanation for why they're thinking the way they are. I, I mentioned at the beginning that postmodernism is kind of a, a community thing. It, it's, it's, it's social. And of course, we have social media, we have all kinds of ways to connect with people, um, both locally and around the world. So I, I want to introduce, before we move on, one more term to kind of try to make sense of why postmodernism uh, comes at life the way it does. And um, I alluded to this earlier, but it, it's this concept that um, a famous philosopher, Wittgenstein, called language games. Now, you don't have to care about the term, but let, let me just try to um, help us understand the concept. So, so if you think of our understanding of truth, I mean, I mean the Bible is true not just for this, this talk for two hours on a Thursday morning or Thursday evening in November 2018. Truth um, was, uh, the scripture is settled in heaven. Um, it, it, is true. Um, it was true. It is true. It will be true. It, it, it doesn't change. And God has preserved his word so that we have access to that truth. Um, and he's given us his spirit to illumine us to understand that truth. But for a postmodernist, he says, well, language is kind of this game. Like, like you get the game and you open it up and you look at the instructions and the instructions tell you how to play that game. Those instructions don't have anything to do with how you're going to work tomorrow. They, they don't have anything to do with, with how you should um, raise your kids. They don't have anything to do with the ultimate meaning in life. They just make sense of the game. 
And so um, these thinkers latched onto this idea and said, okay, well, that, that must be what language is. It, it, it doesn't have meaning for everybody. It just kind of helps us make sense of our little community or our little group or even our little family. And, and, and so they'll say, yeah, if, if your church wants to get together and, and talk in a certain language, so to speak, and try to make sense of life that way, fine. But don't say that your instructions for your game, so to speak, that language has any direct bearing on, on the rest of our lives. Like, like it matters for the rest of us. We're not playing that game. All right. And so you can see how um, they just kind of, they just kind of shut down the idea that there's any sort of, of truth beyond um, what our little community believes. Um, let's see if I can advance here. All right, there's my secondhand smoke illustration. I'll, I'll keep moving here, but um, uh, you can see that in pictorial form. Now, um, I want to I want to talk for a minute about um, the the motivation of of postmodernism. I don't spend a lot of time on this, but but I think this really exposes um, postmodern thinking for uh, what it is. Um. This is from, I think you can see there at the bottom of the screen, a, a guy named Aldous Huxley. He, I don't know if you'd call him postmodernism because he's writing in the 1930s. That's a little bit early for postmodernism. But anyway, he is one of the thinkers that, that led to the postmodern world in which we live. He said this, most ignorance is vincible ignorance. What he means by that is, is we're responsible. It, it actually is a biblical idea that we're actually responsible for the ignorance. Um, we don't get a pass. He says, um, we don't know because we don't want to know. Um, it is our will that decides how and on what subjects we shall use our intelligence. Those who determine that there is no meaning in the world generally do so, he says, because for one reason or another, it suits their books that the world should be so meaningless. There was one admirably simple method of confuting these people and at the same time justifying ourselves in our political and erotic revolt we could deny that the world had any meaning whatsoever. Okay, now that's, that, that, that's a lot of, of, of language, speaking of language, there's a lot of words and, and that you might have kind of gotten lost in there, I don't know, but, but here's, here's what he's saying. He's saying that, that we wanted to carry out a revolution, these thinkers in Europe in the early 20th century. And so one of the ways we determined we could do that is if we asserted to people that words don't have their traditional meaning. They, they don't mean what you think they mean. They're just words. They, they, just, they just refer to one another. They don't refer to reality outside themselves. And he says that was one of the ways, perhaps the way that we could get people to, um, to join us in this political and sexual revolution is by asserting that there is no Tr ultimate truth there 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 is no traditional meaning to words and and i think you see that you, you you see that in a lot of places it's not the only explanation for why there's revolution and chaos in various countries obviously but one of the reasons why there's so much unrest and uncertainty that leads to depression and darkness is because um, people aren't really sure that that there is such a thing as truth, that there is such a thing as, as meaning beyond simply, again, your interpretation. I, I think this is, um, this is very sobering to read what one of these thinkers was attempting to do through the ideas that became postmodernism. Um, you know, wh where this leads ethically is that anything goes. I mean, I think somebody mentioned already Judges 17. Um, Judges 21 says the same thing, um, that everyone does what is right in his own eyes. And it is, it's chaos. Those, those latter chapters of Judges, those, those, um, J Judges is, is a kind of a discouraging book um, in, in a lot of ways. Um, and, and unless you remember that it sets you up for good things to come. But those last three chapters in Judges are very dark. Um, you, you feel like you need to you need to clean your hands and, and your eyes after after you read them, and 
and, and it's a picture of what happens when people say there is no truth that governs me. There is no God that, that gets to say this is what is real and this is what that means for you. When we throw that off, then anything goes. And that's why in a lot of cultures today, there is just a lot of um, a lot of chaos and people doing what they whatever they want to do they're, they're doing what's right in their own eyes they're, they're doing what makes them feel good uh, one thinker um, Foucault said an individual's greatest good is to maximize pleasure or I think that's somebody's summary actually of what he says to, to maximize pleasure well if that's what you think um, then there are going to be a lot of problems now how do we respond to this? And we want to take this, this second hour or the part of it that's left and talk about how to respond to uh, postmodernism in a biblical way. And uh, I, I want to point a few things out and then draw our attention to a couple of important passages of Scripture. Uh, the first thing that I, I think we need to um, uh, we need to remember is that there is a profound difference between rejecting all meta narratives, okay, all stories that, that explain, seek to explain life, all explanations that say this is the truth and therefore this is how you should live. There's a difference between rejecting all of those and, and rejecting all but one. I mean, we reject all but one, um, but but, but there's, there's a big difference. And actually what postmodernism does is it says, well, there isn't, anything such, there isn't any such thing as worldview. There isn't any explanation to all of life. But, but that in and of itself, as so many people have pointed out, is an explanation. It, it is itself a worldview. It's kind of the non-worldview worldview, uh, if you will. So um, th there is a difference between saying there is no such thing as um, truth and explanation to all of life and that there there are a lot of bad ideas out there and there are all all but one of those are false worldviews we need to um uh, we need to distinguish that sometimes uh, people say well um uh t to say that there's only one way um y you're just um you're, you're, you're just using Western logic. And, and I know a lot of you actually don't reside in the West. Um, but I, I would just say this. Um, uh, the, the idea that there's only one way is not a Western idea. Okay, if it was just a Western idea, then yeah, sure, um, get rid of it. But, but the, the, the reality that there is such a thing as truth, that, that there is such a thing as non-contradiction, in other words, um, I'm going to fly actually this afternoon to another part of the United States, um, uh, a state called Texas. Well, I can't go to Texas this afternoon and stay in Greenville. I can't buy a ticket to Jakarta and expect to end up in Paris. Um, there, there is such a thing as reality that language, um, that language refers to that, um, that isn't contradictory. You, you can't say that something is, is, is black when, it, when it's really white, that, that, that's contradictory. That, that's not a, a Western idea. That, that goes for any language, any people group at, at, at any point in time. And so um, that's something that people in the West actually raise um, uh, about sometimes about the idea that there is such a thing as truth. And I, I just think that it's not, it, it, it's not something to get stuck on. It, it, it's actually not a good argument against truth. Um, a second thing that I think we need to remember, first thing was that um, uh, there is one and only one right way, but there is one, and that's different from saying that there, there is no one right way. The second thing is that we need to remember that, that words do connect to reality. Um, words are either true or they're, or they're not true. And I want to make a distinction here. Um, I, I, I want to make a distinction between um, meaning and significance. Okay. So um, uh, many of you preach God's word on a regular basis or, or you teach it in some setting. Okay. So when you're um, trying to understand what God says in a book like Judges, you're trying to, you're saying, okay, God breathed this out. 
um, through a human writer. Um, what does he mean? I, I want to understand what it means. And I know it was written a long time ago, so I want to understand what it would have meant um, in, you know, 3,000 years ago. But then I'm preaching it or I'm teaching it to my people, so I want them to understand the significance of that. Okay, they don't live 3,000 years ago. They live in 2018. So how do I, we often use the word apply. How do I apply it? How is, how is it significant for their lives today? Um, you, you don't want to start there. Um, as, as if the meaning is, um, meaning doesn't matter, but you don't want to end just with what it meant back then. You want to talk about, okay, how is it, how is it significant now? Well, there's a difference between those two, but, but the point I want to make here is that even if something doesn't seem significant to us, um, it still has meaning. And let me give you some examples. Um, I'll, I'll make three statements. Here's the first statement. China is north of Australia. Okay, I, I don't think that's a controversial statement. Um, um, and I, 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 I'm pretty sure it's true. Okay, China is north of Australia. Now, is that true? Yes. I, is it significant? Well, for me right now, um, I don't have any plans to travel to China or Australia. I'm certainly not going to fly there. I, I, I don't know how to fly. People wouldn't want me to fly um, the plane. So is it, is it very significant to me? N not, not a whole lot actually at, at this point in time, but that doesn't mean it's not true. Uh, let me give you a, a second example. Um, this is a sports example. Uh, so I like the game of soccer and, um, uh, I'll make this statement. Mexico is the best national soccer team in North America. Well, I, that, that, is, that is also true. Mexico right now is, is better than the American national team, and that's okay. I, obviously, I would cheer for my country, but, you know, not a, not a big deal. So not, not very significant. Probably for some of you, it has absolutely no significance. You, you, could, you could not care less. You're not going to think about Mexico or United States soccer ever again after I say this, and that's perfectly fine. But, but that doesn't take away from the fact that, that the statement is still true. Okay. And let me give you a third statement. Jesus is the only way of salvation. That statement is true and it has, it has the greatest significance for all of us. That's not just an interpretation. So, so when postmodernism says, well, those are just interpretations. That's just what it, what it means to you. That's just its significance. We, we've got to say, well, no, statements have meaning. Statements have meaning whether they seem significant or not. And, and there are some statements uh, the truth of which is significant for all of us. And of course, that's, that's where scripture, um, scripture comes in. Um, <laughs> I'm just looking at the comments here. Better than Canada for sure. Uh, yeah, ab absolutely. I can agree with that. Um, let's, let's talk about some, some biblical categories. And I'm, I've kind of lost track, honestly, um, of where we are here in the, the PowerPoint. Let me just advance this. Okay, before we do that, I, I thought I was missing something. Um, I, I think this analogy is helpful. It, it's actually kind of pastoral in its, its implications. All right. I mentioned Wittgenstein in language games. Later in his life, he came to, to, the, to the conclusion, apparently, that there was... Um, no way out of the bottle for the fly. Now, now what, what in the world does that mean? Okay, he would say that philosophy in his early years, philosophy is to show people like a fly how to get out of the bottle. You, you, the, the fly is captured in the bottle and it's buzzing around, it's hitting the sides and it doesn't know how to get out. Well, you show the fly how to get out. You, you show people how to understand life. But, but at the, near the end of his life, he evidently came to the conclusion that there was no way out of the bottle. And so instead of trying to figure a way out or show people a way out, as philosophy has tried to do through the ages, instead we just um, we settle for trying to make life as good as we can inside the bottle. Now, that, that's kind of, you know, obviously very philosophical and, um, and, and maybe not something that that is very significant for us in and of itself, but here's where I think it's significant. Uh, because you are working with a lot of people that they're trapped in a bottle and they're, they're, they have explanations for life, but those explanations haven't worked out. 
um, they've tried the explanation of maybe a false religion, or, or maybe they tried to move re beyond religion, and they are secular, and they they no longer profess to believe in any kind of God. And they're they're trying. They've tried to make sense of life, and it's just not working anymore. And so what what they have resolved to do is just try to make life as good as it can be inside the bottle. They're not trying to find a way out anymore. They're just trying to make life comfortable inside the bottle. And I think at least in my context, my American context, that, that happens a lot. There's a really good book by a guy named David Wells called God in the Whirlwind, obviously a, an allusion to a, a biblical metaphor. And, and in that book, he contrasts um, a world that is rooted in truth and a world that is resorting to therapy. And I see that a lot, even with, with Christian, I think truly Christian young people that come to my university, where um, they don't think as much in, in the category of truth. They often think in the category of therapy. How, how can I make life better? How can God make life better for me? Their, their prayers end up being, God, help me with this. God, take away that. God, please heal this. <clears throat> God, um, you know, give, give, give me a break. You know, I'm, I'm so overwhelmed with my studies. And, and God does, of course, teach in his word that we should pray. We should pray for, um, for his rescue. We should pray for healing. We, sh we should pray for his enablement and his help. Um, I prayed for that this morning, um, that, I, that, that he would enable me, because I knew I was not up to the task of, of teaching um, this effectively. Um, those are very appropriate and biblical prayers. But, but if I'm thinking that that's what life is all about, that God exists to make my life better and easy, then I've totally turned um, turned things around. Um, I'm mistaking what is the what is the result of a life lived for God's glory, um, uh, and and the joy of that. I'm mistaking that um, for being the thing that I should I should desire and go after, and, and that God instead of my serving God, God actually serves me. And so I think whether it's Christian people. Um, or whether it's unbelievers, a lot of times they've kind of given up. Dr. Arnold mentioned this at the outset when he was talking about people who, you know, they're just trying to, they're just trying to make the next paycheck and, you know, have enough milk in the fridge or, or, or whatever. They're just trying to make life work on a day-to-day -day basis. And they maybe even given up on trying to figure things out. So part of our calling, I think, is to help people understand that the, that the big questions of life really, really do matter. They may not matter, they may not seem to matter today if life is easy or life is just regular, but okay, what happens when the doctor says you have cancer? Uh, what, what happens when um, you're facing pressure and things aren't as easy anymore? Um, what, what happens when you, the paycheck, you, you, you don't have a job anymore and the paychecks don't come in? Um, then we start to reflect a little bit more on, on these big questions and we start to realize that, that I, there has to be a way out of, of the bottle to use um, this analogy. Um, I'm going to, I'm, I'm going to actually um, go back, just keep it on that slide for now and um, come to that quote here in just a minute. Let me talk for a few minutes and then we'll take a break for questions about some categories. So the first category is truth. Um, a really good book. I'll put up a slide at the very end that has three book suggestions on it. This is one of them. It's called The Gagging of God by D.A. Carson. It's a thick book. You have to be really serious if, if you want to read it, but if you're serious and you really want a good read on this topic, that would be one of my recommendations. And he says this, a reluctance to speak of truth is notoriously distant from the biblical writers. Okay, in plainer language, he's saying the, the, um, the caution that people in a postmodern world feel about stating truth is totally foreign to, to those who wrote scripture. They state truth so straightforwardly. They, they, they are not ashamed of it. I'm think, think of Paul. I, I am not ashamed, for I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it's the power of God and the salvation for, for anyone and everyone who believes, the Jew first and also the Greek. There, there's, 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 no, there's no shame. There's, there's no hesitation. There's no caution. And so we have to, we just can't, um, we can't breathe in that secondhand smoke. We've got to remind ourselves that truth is, is a central biblical category and not be ashamed of that. 
um, a, a, a wonderful book of the Bible to really meditate on when it comes to this um, idea of truth is the book of John. If you want to do a, a, a devotional study that may help you in, in your ministry as well, work through the book of John, um, you know, get your Bible program or whatever you do to look up references and, and, and look up the, the, the word truth in the book of John and do a little word study on that. It, it's a wonderful study. It's very reassuring after, after a talk like this about so much uncertainty. And, um, and it reminds us, among other things, that truth is both personal um, and it is what, what theologians call propositional. In other words, it, it is about facts, like Jesus is, is God. Jesus came about 2,000 years ago, and he lived on earth for 33 or so years. Jesus bodily rose from the tomb. You, you can't be a Christian and not believe those facts. But at the same time, truth is, is, is not just um, believing certain facts like, you know, well, I, I believe that Dr. Arnold is in the Philippines this morning, but, but, but that, that, that doesn't, you know, um, truth is more than just assenting that that's where he's residing currently. Um, truth, biblical truth, is, is about Jesus Christ. It's, it's both. Sometimes people say, well, I, I don't I don't want to just get into all the facts. That doesn't really matter. I just want to believe in Jesus. Well, to believe in the true Jesus, you have to believe facts about him. It's, it's both personal and propositional. And, and a really um, important passage of Scripture, and I'll direct your attention to it now, is John 18. In John 18, Jesus is on trial. And, um, and in that trial... Um, uh, Pilate, Pilate says, are, are you the son of God? And Jesus says, well, well are, are you asking me that? You know, do you really want to know, or did somebody say that, and you're just kind of copying what they said? And, and, and Pilate says, well, you know, well, I'm not a Jew. Why are, why are you asking me these Jewish kind of questions? He, he sidesteps Jesus's question, and, and, and he says, you know, just tell me uh, what, whether you're supposed to be the king of Jews. Tell, tell me, tell me, um, if you're a king, and Jesus says, says, well, um, my kingdom is, is not of this world. If my kingdom were, were the kind of kingdom that you're thinking of, then I would have had my followers come, and, and, and we would have been armed, and I could have summoned angels, so to speak, and, 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 and we could have been done with, with, with all of this trial um, that I'm going through. If my kingdom were of this world, Okay, then things would be very different right now. But but actually, my kingdom is is not of this world. It, it's not according to human wisdom. And then he, he he says, "This is why I came to the earth. This, this is why I was born as God, God the Son, as a man, um, thirty three or so years ago. This is why I was born to bear witness to the truth." We can't give up on truth as a category. It, truth is why Jesus came. He came to bear witness to the truth. John 1.14 says um, um, that Jesus Christ is full of grace and truth. He showed the glory of the Father, the glory as, as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth, which, which looks back to the Old Testament in Exodus 34. Um, he, he says in, um, in chapter 4 that we worship God in spirit sincerely and according to truth. Um, he says in John 8, 32, it, it's truth that's going to set you free. It, it's not that, that, that truth is, is something that people use as a power tool. It's actually that the truth it, it itself gives power. It, it gives power to set us free like nothing else can. In, later in John 8, he's, he's, he's talking to the, the Pharisees, and, 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 and he says, you're of your father, the devil. Um, you're bearing the likeness of your father because um, he is he is a father of, of lies. He's actually the great deceiver. Truth is so important, um, and that's what Satan took direct aim at in the Garden of Eden. He, I mean, he said, has God really said? I mean, does, does, does what God say um, really matter? Um, and he inserts that doubt, that uncertainty, that skepticism, that lie into Eve's mind. 
Um, so, so truth is, is such an important category. You, I, I already quoted John 14, 6. Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. If you don't believe this truth, you have no hope whether you're religious or not. And in John 17, 17, um, Jesus prays to his father in what's called the high priestly prayer. Um, he says, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. We can agree that people a lot of times say things are true. They use language to control other people, but there is a major exception to that. And that is when God speaks. When people speak, a lot of times things don't go well. But when God speaks, it's always true. Um, and so we, we, have to, we, we have to hold firmly to that and, and graciously, but, but, but with conviction, help people understand it. Pilate said in response, well, what is truth? Now, it would be wrong to call Pilate postmodern because postmodernism um, didn't exist in the first century. But he anticipates that skepticism. And he, he says, well, well, what is truth? You came to bear witness to the truth. Well, well what, what is that? And really what he's doing there, um, and I think I have a slide on this. Yeah. Um, in his commentary on John, Andreas Kostenberger says, contrary to the claims of postmodernism, it is not true that the only truth there is is power. In this, Jesus gives hope to all those who stand for truth and because of this are oppressed by those in power. Actually, in a lot of places in the world, scriptural truth isn't, isn't power. It, it actually puts you in a vulnerable posi position because people are so antagonistic against it. But you can have hope. Maybe you're feeling this pressure right now. I don't know your context, but, but undoubtedly there are people um, that we're going to try to minister to that are going to be feeling this, and they can have this kind of confident expectation that that the truth actually does set us free and it gives us strength in the midst of a storm, whether that's a personal storm or, or a storm in our culture. So we, we really, um, this category of truth and the study in John, I, I would really um, suggest that you spend some time thinking about. Uh, another, uh, let me give you another suggestion in terms of an important scriptural passage, and that's Acts 17. Um, I haven't been obviously listening in on the other lectures, but perhaps um, perhaps uh, people have mentioned uh, Acts 17 before. It's, it's a very significant passage when you're ministering to people that don't have a biblical framework. So for in the United States for a long time, a lot of people were familiar with the Bible. Now, not so much. Um, people aren't as familiar with scripture. And so this, this preaching of Paul in Athens to people who had a very different belief system, very different worldview, is, is significant. And, and here's the one thing I want to point out about this passage. It starts in verse 16 and goes through the, the end of the chapter, Acts 17. But what I want to point out is this. Paul did not go to Athens and see that these uh, philosophers had a different view on life. And he didn't sit around and say, okay, well, I've I've got to um, I've got to be careful about how dogmatic I am. Um, they're probably not going to understand my categories. Like if I talk about truth and, and, and if I make claims about who Jesus is, that they're probably not going to understand that because they don't they don't believe that. So I'm going to have to figure out another way to kind of entice them um, to to um, see things my way. That, that that is so so far from what Paul does. Um, he, he, he gets up and he says, hey, you know, I, I saw this idol over here and, and this inscription to the unknown God, and, and, and I want to tell you about that. Actually, actually, you're searching for a God that, that you haven't quite figured out. Let me tell you about him. He, he's actually very different from your supposed gods. He's actually a God who, who wasn't made by human hands. He, he actually made your hands. And, and he's not served by things that you can give him. Actually, he created everything. He's, he's given everything to you. And, and you may feel like he's distant, but, but actually he's not distant at all. He, he, he's actually very near to all of us. He's very involved in human life, or we would call it providence. And, 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 and actually there, there is a hope because there was a man who was raised from the dead it's not just that he was reincarnated or that there's some hope of 
of, of, of eternal life that's separate from our existence now, actually his body was, was raised and made new by God the Father, and he's, and he's the judge, and, and, and God is, is waiting for you to repent on him. He's, he's actually delaying his judgment, his final judgment, so that you will turn from your sin, and, and you will actually um, bow to this resurrected Lord. And, and yeah, a lot of people um, turned away and thought Paul was, was speaking, you know, foolishness, but there were some people who believed, and including uh, this person named Dionysius the Areopagite, evidently an influential person. Um, some people b- believed, yes, there was mocking. Yes, some people said, man, I'm not quite sure. Let's talk again. But some people did believe, and, and, and God says in Acts 18 that he has people in every city like that. And so we can have confidence that if we will state the truth clearly um, and, and, and understand that, that, yes, even if we're gracious in how we do it, that, that it's going to turn some people off, it, it might um, bring a lot of pressure on us. But if we'll do that, God in his grace is going to work in some people's lives, every person's life. Okay, that he that he intends to call. He he he's going to work in their lives, and he's going to save them through the clear declaration of truth. I just think it's so important in a world that is so uncertain to remind ourselves of of what God says very straightforwardly. And I think Paul's example in Athens is a really good um, is a really good thing to um, a really good example to follow. Um, let me put this up in front of you, and then I think uh, maybe uh, we'll, we'll stop and, and see if there are any questions. Um, this is taken from another book that I would recommend, although I will give um, uh, one disclaimer in this book um, by Grot- Groteis. You can see at the bottom there. He actually takes a view on, on women in the church that I totally disagree with, that I think is not faithful to Scripture. Um, but beyond that, his, his, his understanding of postmodernism is very helpful in a, booth, in a book called Truth Decay. And I'm adapting what, I, um, uh, what I'm saying here um, from, from that book. And so here's some, maybe some helpful scripture references. So, so truth is revealed by God. Your word is truth, John 17, 17 says. Objective truth is knowable. Like it's, it's not just knowable to people in Poland or people in Siberia or people in Jamaica. It's, it's knowable and it's universal. Romans 1.20 says that it's evident to all of us. It's evidence because of creation. It's, it's, it's evident because God has put a sense of, of who he is and any moral framework in our very souls. Okay, Romans 1 and 2 talk about that. Thirdly, Christian truth is absolute in its nature. That there is no other way to the Father. Acts four twelve, uh, as you as you well know, talks about this. That He's the only name under heaven whereby people can be saved. Okay. Uh, fourthly, the truth of God is eternally engaging and momentous. Um, those are Grotius's words. It's not trendy or superficial. And in, in other words, um, it it lasts forever. It, it doesn't. It, it doesn't go in and out of popularity. It's not like the truth of the 1950s isn't the truth for today because, I mean, we've got iPhones and we've got Zoom technology, so how could the truth be the same? No, no God says, my word is settled in heaven. Everything else is going to perish. I mean, the grass is going to grow, and a few days later, it's, it, it's going to die. But but my word is, is eternal. We can count on that. We can count that the, the scriptures that were, were written, that were actually penned, um, um, in some cases, thousands of years ago, okay? Actually, all of it was, was, is at least almost 2,000 years old. We can, we can be confident that it is, it is just as important and relevant and true today as it ever has been, and we've got to believe that. Um, fifthly, I've lost track. I guess it's sixthly. Truth is exclusive. It's specific. It's it's antithetical. Okay, you're familiar with that passage in Matthew seven that broad is the way that leads to destruction. Destruction narrow is is the way that leads to eternal life. It's constricting. It it is narrow. When people say you're you're so narrow, you believe that there's only one way. Well, we don't want that to be because we're we're being ugly and mean spirited, but 
but actually there, there is only one way and we would be unloving to go along with this postmodern thinking that, that it's relative and, and, and whatever you want truth to be is, is okay as, as, as long as you're a good person. And finally, truth is not um, a means to an, an end. It, it's, it's an end in itself. It, it, the truth of God isn't a way for us to get what we want. The, the truth is who God is. It's for his glory, Romans eleven thirty six. 36, for of him and through him to him are all things to whom be the glory forever. That comes after a long explanation, perhaps the longest in scripture of salvation and God's righteousness. And he says at the end of it, this is for God's glory. This, this is truth. This is, this is ultimately about him. And, and so we, we can't, we can't um, start thinking about truth in terms of what does it, what does it do um, for us. Um, let, let, me, let me say one more thing, and, and then I'll see if there are questions. Um, when it comes to knowledge, okay, this is one of the things that postmodernism has tried to point out, that um, how could you, okay, I'll use myself, Eric, how could you say that you know truth? You're, you're a 39-year-old American male who has attended a certain university, who grew up in a certain home. I, I, was, I actually grew up in a home with Christian parents, who's had only certain experiences. You've never been to the Philippines. You've never been to You've, you've never been to Korea. You've, you've never been to Germany. How, how could you say that you know the truth? Okay, let, let me just address that very briefly. Um, there is a difference that I think we need to make between exhaustive knowledge, complete knowledge of everything, a, a kind of omniscience that says, I, I understand all things and I can explain all things, in a knowledge that is sufficient. In other words, I shouldn't, I shouldn't act like I know everything because I, I don't. I, I am not God. I do not have omniscience. I can't explain everything. There are many things about your lives that, that, that I would have to work really hard to understand because I, I, I'm not you, and, and I understand as, as you understand. I don't have um, I, I have a very small amount of knowledge, and, and, and that, that I think we can, we can agree to, we, we, can, we can understand that our knowledge is not complete, it's not exhaustive, but there's a difference between having a complete kind of knowledge of everything that can answer every question, um, and, and a knowledge that is sufficient, a knowledge of God's Word that says, I can't explain it all, in fact, there are even some things that God tells me he hasn't revealed. There are secret things he calls them in Deuteronomy 29. But actually, there are a lot of things that he has revealed. And by his spirit, 1 Corinthians 2, he's given me his spirit so that I might have the mind of Christ. Not so that I become Christ myself as if I'm God, but, but so that I can actually think God's thoughts after him. And, and that's part of, of the gift of salvation, that, that Christ gives us his Holy Spirit. And so, so yes, I, I've, I've said some things probably today that aren't exactly correct this morning. But, but, but as much as I understand Scripture and, and, can, um, and can truly um, communicate what Scripture says— to that degree, I can be completely confident in the knowledge God has given me because it's based on eternal truth. And I think we have to make that distinction. We don't have to say we know everything. We, we have to say, though, that what God says, by his Spirit's enablement, we can understand, anyone can understand who will believe, and, and therefore have hold on eternal truth that is sufficient. It's, it's enough for life here and life forever, for, for life and godliness, um, as Peter says in 2 Peter 1. Uh, it's about 8.50. We've got 10 minutes. Um, any, any, any questions? Anything, Dr. Arnold, that, that you want to bring up that we should discuss? This is great. Uh, yeah, and as you men have questions, just start dropping them into the chat. Um, that little concept that you gave there at the end, it's, it's excellent. Uh, I'm thinking there of planting uh, warranted, like the idea of warranted beliefs. And so, mm -hmm. yeah, you know, I can't, I can't completely eliminate every, I, I can't give an argument that's going to convince every knower out there absolutely for sure every time. But I do have some ideas that are warranted. They're like, I have data for them. 
So yeah, we talked about that with uh, Dr. Terrell Paul earlier. Some of what I got here when you were just talking that through that was kind of almost a virtue epistemology or um, you know, like in virtue ethics, um, almost in the same way, like how my knowing capacity is deeply connected in with my character. And so God giving yes. his spirit and transforming me as a knower <laughs> actually changes the, the way I then process information. One other piece that was sticking out in my mind here was, do you do this, you, you work through nuanced distinctions and complex ideas like outside of a, a directly exegetical or scriptural context. And you, you come back to the text and you discover the text saying things in profoundly precise ways or incredibly balanced mm -hmm. ways that touch both sides of attention. Mm -hmm. um, and I, so I think mm -hmm. here, like wisdom books, like wisdom or just the biblical epistemology, it's not confident in a certain way that it says like, so, you know, there is no other application of this particular question. Like wisdom books will leave you in some places. Answer a fool according to his folly, don't answer it basically answer is it's complicated you're gonna to have to figure this one out yeah. um and i think that's recognizing what postmodernism has legitimately taught us in a way that like okay it's not simple and it's not just follow these rules and you'll always get the right answer it isn't that simple and yet right. scripture still comes back and says but there is truth and there is folly right so don't be a yes. fool follow what god has said and it's going to come from god what do Absolutely. you think yeah i and I, I think that um, postmodernism implicitly acknowledges that there is such a thing as truth. They work very hard to um, persuade people that there is no truth, but that very effort is evidence that there is such a thing, <laughs> um, or they, they wouldn't care to persuade people. Um, and, and I think your point about virtue epistemology and, and this idea of our character having everything to do with, with our knowledge and how we view things is so important. I, I think it's something that in worldview teaching is often um, diminished or overlooked. And, and, and there's, a, there's this statement, I think it's in The Magician's Nephew. Uh, we talked about the last battle a little bit. I think it's in The Magician's Nephew um, where, uh, I'm going to paraphrase here, basically it says, um, how you view things de de depends on, on, on who you are. It depends on, on where you're sitting, and it depends on who you are, your, your character. And so worldview isn't just having, you know, we often use the analogy of glasses, you know, having the right glasses on. But, but a lot of times we can put on the right glasses, have the right concepts. We can even, you know, really talk about scripture in, in seemingly profound ways. But, but if, if my heart is not, humble before the Lord, if, if I'm not contrite in spirit and I'm not trembling at his word, if, if, if I'm not, if the truth is not sanctifying me, then I can, I can say I believe things, but it's going to twist how I actually live that out. I'm, I'm going to love things so much that regardless of what I say, I believe that love is going to overpower them. So I, I do think that um, the truth changing us personally is, is very significant in our ability both to honor the Lord personally and, and as well uh, minister to other people. I think that's a really good point that you made. And what do you think of even, so this is like, I'm thinking of an educational context or a discipleship context. Might we, might we, we come without even thinking about it. We're coming to the problem as though this is an uh, informational problem. I've got to get this informational content into this person's head. Um, at some point, the conversation has to go, hey, why do you love sin more than God? You know, or at some point, why are you making mm -hmm. this choice? Um, because you can keep on throwing information at the guy and his brain is just going to dump it into categories that aren't right, you know, because there's something deeper going on there. Right. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah, I, th I think that's why discipleship is, is, is so important. Um, you, you can communicate things in a lot of different ways to the web, et cetera, and it's very helpful. Um, but discipleship is a very personal thing. And so I think as we try to, whether it's a church setting or an institutional setting, whether we're trying to help others, we've got to, we've got to really challenge one another. We've got to speak truth into one another's lives as it impacts us personally. Uh, I, I think of Hebrews 3, 12, and 13, that, that, 
that say, exhort one another daily while it's called today, lest you be hardened by the deceitfulness of sin. It, it hit me a few years ago. I was in seminary and I realized reading that verse, it's not just that I'm a day away from being deceived by sin, but being hardened in that deceitfulness. And so I need people speaking into my truth every day, or at least willing to do so ab ab about truth, not just in an intellectual way, um, or a scripture knowledge way, but in a way that's really changing who, who I am. Okay, very, very different direction. Um, we have talked some here about uh, apologetic approaches, so like an evidentialist or classical approach, et cetera. Um, I am not like a hard-boiled presuppositionalist personally in the sense that it's like, you know, kind of an idea that uh, there was like a Martin Luther moment or something that began with yeah. until I'm just not there. But um, still, I've wondered, is there, and do you think that uh, a self-consciously presuppositional approach, and I would say something like a John Frame-ish form of mm -hmm. it, incarnation of it, might be better positioned to speak to postmodernism. And sometimes the critique gets made that like classic or evidentialist apologetics is almost like stuck in a corner still speaking to a modernist. Um, where post or where presuppositionalism actually is engaging with the categories that are that are rattling around in a postmodernist set. What do you think? I, I, I absolutely agree. Um, I I would find myself in that very same area, um, certainly on the presuppositional side of things, um, but not the kind of the hardcore. I, I think I think the right kind of presuppositionalism uses evidence, and the main point there being that scripture uses evidence. <laughs> um, but but I do think that um, evidential apologetics tend to treat people as if they're still thinking in modernist categories that there is such a thing as one truth and, and they have the wrong truth, but you can persuade them otherwise. Again, I, I think we should be persuasive. I think we should, we never know what God is going to use. Uh, to draw somebody to himself, you know, what part of scripture or, or what, what point that, that might actually show them that their worldview is flawed and it might, the spirit might open them up to receive truth through that. But I, I do think that postmodernism is, is challenging just the very core assumptions of modernism. And, and if we just throw evidence at people, it's really kind of playing into their hand. In fact, John Feinberg in his book, Can You Believe It's True, talks about this. He's got two chapters on um, answering postmodernism. He also answers modernism, but but he says that the game has changed. Now, I, that book, it, it's, it's helpful. It's really weighty. It's not one of the things that I would put forward as, as the first thing to read, but he makes that very argument, um, Dr. Arnold, that, that, that you've suggested. Do you think Okay, so you gave your two stories earlier, like the two, the house with the two levels in it. So, I mean, just to clarify that idea or bring it into focus a little bit, it feels like people are still operating off of very modernist suppositions on the lower level, on the love, like level of science and daily life. Um, and then it's only in by like cutting right, like taking, taking a knife, an epistemic knife and cutting right across all of life and putting everything else into this other category, which happens to be the same categories that they would demand like in the secular space, in the city, in the, in this, the square, the public square, those are the spaces you're not allowed to bring things in, like arts and religion and like, what do you want to call it? Like the more humanistic parts of life. Um, right. Is that fair? Am I, I mean, is, and, and is this the thing we can call people's attention to? Like, hey, you've got a life where you've, You've, not, you've divided things and you're not connecting them. Yeah, I, I think that it's that second part of life that is hardest for um, people to explain. I mean, I, I think the idea that we evolved is totally ridiculous. Um, it's blasphemous, actually. Romans 1 talks about this. Um, but as amazing, as in, in, you know, incredible as it is to think that we evolved, I, I think even beyond the material to explain um, the soft realities of life, so to speak, um, heroism and love and, and joy and desire and relationships, that's even harder for naturalism to explain. So I, I think that kind of like that coffee drink, um, the, the, main, the main roast that people drink um, is still naturalism. 
but that they have sprinkled in postmodernism. And so they, they're not willing to leave their naturalistic presuppositions, but at the same time, they're, they're trying to sneak um, other explanations of life in there because they realize that, that to switch the metaphor, that that box can't explain everything. And that, that's where postmodernism comes in. In some ways, it's just an extension of those same presuppositions, but trying to um, explain, uh, explain other parts of life. It's really interesting. Okay, I've got uh, one more question here, and then you said something about giving us some books. Um, yep. So this is from uh, Dr. K, Dr. Amibi Ashayama here. Would you relate postmodernism to existentialism? Uh, a sense of, let's say, like a sense of being feeling oriented or that kind of thing. Are those, those questions part of the root of this? Uh, Dr. K, that's a great question. Um, as I understand it, they're very uh, similar existentialism came a little bit earlier in philosophical the history of philosophical thought um, the way I distinguish in the primary way is that existentialism focuses on the individuals um, creation of meaning of value of purpose whereas postmodern tends to be more collective more social in its in its outlook um, the group making sense of life um, rather than you know the, the individualism of of existentialist thought uh, but the, but they're they're intertwined and i think um at some point they're, they're they're very similar and it's hard to distinguish them yeah i'm kind of extending this a little bit but so there's this moment that De descartes and later kant like bring the center of knowledge the epistemic center is brought into the knower um and so then that that kind of works its way out through all of these ideas um that's a very interesting, this has never hit me before. So is it like in postmodernism that that the, the center of knowledge is in me and it actually becomes like the center of knowledge is now in us? Yeah, um, so I would say just very quickly, um, pre-modern, what they call pre-modern thought, the focus is on the object of knowledge um, and ultimately God. Um, in in modernist thought the the focus becomes more on the on the process of knowing and getting the right process and you know figuring out through our reason um changing the authority of as i mentioned um and then existentialism says okay yeah but you know we can't the, the solutions, the rational solutions that culture has come up with obviously have not worked out well on a wide scale. So it turns, it, the focus turns inward. And that's where existentialism and postmodernism are very similar because the focus goes to the, the subject where, where I interpret things. Postmodernism, at least um, um, aspects of it, tend to be, yeah, more collective so that I'm not going to be so audacious to say that I figure out meaning, but, but maybe the group of us can figure out meaning for our little community. We're not going to say it's universal, but we're going to say it's going to work for us. That's great. That's great. Okay. Did you have some books and then I guess... Yeah, let me advance here. There they are. So I mentioned Gagging of God, Truth Decay with that one caveat um, about egalitarianism, and then um, this is four essays... Uh, whatever happened to truth? Um, among other things, those are resources I found very helpful. What is? I'm forgetting. It, I'm reading it, but I forget the title. Carson has a shorter book, and it's on um, inclusivism, toleration. The it's the intolerance. the intolerance of tolerance. Yeah, that's a nice book as, like maybe a more digestible form of the gagging of God. Yeah, I that that's that's good. I, maybe I should have included that as well. Intolerance of tolerance is a very helpful book. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much for your time. Um, have a great flight. <laughs> we really appreciate <laughs> you giving your time here. This is a very, very helpful discussion. Absolutely. Honored, honored to be a part of it. Thank you. It was our honor. We'll look forward to uh, all of everyone else seeing you back on, what are we, this is Thursday. We'll see you on Monday. And that'll be talking about religious pluralism. So Dr. Newton, thank you again. Have a great day. And I uh, right. look forward to seeing everyone later. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.